Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode in our webinar series. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, if you've joined us on a previous episode and you've come back for more, if it's your first time joining us, it's fantastic to have you. Now, we have a big topic today, uh, and one we get asked a lot of questions about, and I'm assuming one that everyone is going to want to know about at some point in the career of their company. So what we're looking at today is how to take money out of your limited company. Uh, so what we'll look at today, just to give you a bit of an overview of the structure, so we'll look at uh, the overview of the key four methods of how to take money out of your company, namely we're looking at dividends, uh, salaries, we'll look at director's loans, and we'll look at expenses. We'll have some important information for our non-resident customers, so people outside the UK, and we'll also look at some practical examples to give a bit of life to what we're talking about. And as always, we will have time for questions and answers towards the end. Now, just some introductions before we go any further. So my name is Liam. I'm one of the managers here with First Formations, uh, and I'm your host for this webinar series. As well as that, my previous experience has been in the financial industry, working in consumer credit uh, products in sales, sales management, and analysis. And joining me here today, I have Nicholas Campion. He is our Chartered Secretary and Corporate Governance Professional, and is one of the directors here with First Formations, and he heads up our sister brand, Linear Cosec. So just uh, if you're not aware, who we are here at First Formations and what we do. So at First Formations, we're the UK's leading company formations agent. We've formed over a million companies and helped thousands and thousands of customers incorporate their companies and benefit from concepts like limited liability. So we do that with our signature packages. We also have a whole range of secretarial services that you can use uh, for incorporation and to help your company throughout its lifetime. And we also offer ongoing services like our address services and as well as a whole host of others. Now just a couple housekeeping rules before we jump into everything. So we are on a Zoom call today so everyone will be muted just so that you can hear us clearly and uh, you do also have a chat function on Zoom so it's either on the side or the top depending on what version of Zoom you're using. As we go through feel free to pop any questions you may have into that chat function and we'll get to as many questions as we can towards the end. Now as well as that, this session today is being recorded. So if anything happens, if you drop off or, or you can't get back on or whatever might happen, uh, the recording will go up on our YouTube channel. So give us, say, 24, 48 hours after the recording today and we'll get that one up there for you as well if you wanted to revisit anything or, or re-watch. So finally, uh, just before we jump in, like I say, this is something that pretty much everyone is going to want to understand how to take money out of their limited company. Now, it's not as simple as just walking up to an ATM with the company card and taking out money. Um, there are very specific and lawful ways that money can be removed from a company. And of course, there are going to be tax considerations that need to be taken into account uh, when we are looking at like I say, how to remove money from a company. And we'll touch on all of that briefly and we'll explore and discuss those methods uh, in a little bit more detail as we go through the webinar. Now, one thing to keep in mind as we do go through all of the information that we have to discuss today, just keep in mind, we can only provide you with very general advice. Everyone's situation is going to be different. Uh, and if you are seeking more specific advice to you and your situation and your company, we would always recommend speaking with a tax advisor or an accountant, someone qualified to give you that information. Because what we'll be discussing is just very general uh, information here today. So to start us off, Nick, I guess why don't we start off by talking about what are these methods of taking m money out of your limited company? Yeah, so, so there's quite a few ways that money can be extracted out of your limited company, taking it from one legal person, that being the company, to yourself. I would just say, because there are a plethora of ways that this can be carried out, we're probably going to be focusing on four key common ways that apply to most situations, or most people will be able to make use of them throughout the course of their life. I would also say that for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus on companies or certain situations. Mm -hmm. We're going to be focusing on a company that's limited by shares. Okay? Now, we the principles I'm talking about here um, across everything will apply to many different situations. Other types of companies like the limited by guarantees. Um, but for simplicity purposes, I'm just going to be talking about them. The other thing that I'm going to be talking about is, firstly, throughout this webinar, we're going to talk as if you are a UK resident. 
Okay, so you live here, you work here, and so forth. Now, as, as you said, Liam, there is a great deal of variation. Everyone's situation is different. I'm going to save just a little bit of time right at the end of this webinar to discuss or bring up a few points in relation to non-residents, because I know there will be a lot of you watching this webinar here today. I promise we'll come on and touch on a few points, but I think for the, for, um, in terms of simplicity, we're just going to talk about um, uh, as if you know, it's a UK resident at this stage. Mm -hmm. Now, the four ways we can take money out of a limited company in the normal sense can be categorized either as a dividend payment, it's probably the one that most people probably associate with companies, limited by, com uh, limited by shares companies. So that's probably going to be uh, one of the main ones. The other one is salary, directors' salaries, directors taking the salary out of a company. The other one will probably be the less uh, well-known, but in many respects a very useful, and a bit of an outlier one here, but the director's loans, we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about expenses. I'm also going to presume, again for simplicity purposes, because if we, if we try to factor everything into account, this webinar will be hours long, days. Yeah. Um, no one wants to listen uh, for that long, certainly not to me. So we're going to presume uh, that uh, you are an owner-manager, maybe the sole director, shareholder of the company. In other words, you're the only ones involved. Again, a lot of the things that I'm talking about, the principles will apply to a whole range of situ situations. But if I can just get it out in a normal sense, and then that's something that you can build on for your own particular circumstances, which, as you quite rightly said, and it's, I'm afraid it's going to be a theme throughout this webinar, which is you, you're going to need advice on your very specific scenarios. So that's what we're going to look, the four ones we're going to look at. We're also going to look at using more than one of them, using a combination of maybe director's loans and salaries. I don't know. Um, and the reason we're going to do that is because what you find is a lot of people, owner managers, limited um, sole director shareholders, do not simply rely on a single source. For various reasons, that can be due to tax matters, to your tax efficiency, just trying to, just trying to uh, keep a lid on tax, making sure we don't overdo it, if you, um, for want of a better word, but also practical uh, reasons, practical reasons as to why maybe certain combinations aren't available to you. That is a key consideration uh, to take into account, and we're going to explore all of those in due course. Brilliant, yeah, and like you say, we'll definitely touch on some information for our non-resident customers. Um, so we'll come to that at the end. Uh, so yeah, like I say, we, we will get onto that for you. Um, now, one of the most common ways of taking money out of a limited company, and probably the one that everyone is going to have heard of before, um, prob more so than the others, I would imagine, is going to be dividends. So run us through what are the rules and procedures when it comes to declaring dividend payments? Okay, yeah, you're absolutely right. Dividends, probably number one thing we think of, um, certainly in a positive sense. So what are dividends? Dividends are essentially the payment of some or all of the after-tax profits out of a limited company to the owners of the company, the members, or as we will refer to it solely today as the shareholders of the company. Now, as a general rule, when dividends are declared, they are shared equally or proportionally to the members on the basis of their ownership. So let's just take an example. Let's just say you have a company with 10 shares. And actually, I'm going to go back on what I said earlier, just presuming that um, you know, just presuming you're the only shareholder director. If you're the only shareholder in that case and the company declares a dividend of £2,000, brilliant, you're going to get £2,000 worth of dividends nice. by the shareholder. Exactly, nice. Having said that, let's just muddy the waters just a little bit by bringing in another shareholder. The payment to those shareholders in most companies will be based proportionally on their ownership. So let's, let's say you've got a company with 10 ordinary shares. There's nothing fancy we need to think about here. And those 10 ordinary shares are split six shares to maybe yourself, Liam, Thank you. and four shares to myself. That same company that declared the dividend of £2,000 would be paying 60% because that's the proportional amount to yourself. So you would get 1200 Whilst I, poor, you know, poor old me, I'd only get £800 of that dividend amount. 
proportionally speaking. That's how it works in most normal companies. I will say that it, and as you will probably be abundantly aware already, it may not always be as simple as that. And it is possible to vary the rights, the dividend rights of particular shareholders. Aware of that, Alphabet shares, different classes of shares giving different treatments, perfectly valid. Uh, it's probably a little bit outside the scope of this webinar today. So if we just look at it on a, on a sort of straight and narrow basis, there we are, it's proportional to our ownership. So that's the theory. That's the theory of what they are, the after-tax profits being paid, however so much uh, is being paid by the company, to the owners, the shareholders of the company. So what's the actual, what's the actual process? Well, the actual process actually starts by making sure you have profit. Okay, this is, I, um, I, this should not be, I know this isn't earth shattering stuff, but people fall afoul of this all the time. You cannot declare any dividends and pay your shareholders or shareholder yourself as a shareholder unless you have profit after it's gone through you know, payment of tax and so forth. Okay, that profit you'll sometimes hear it referred to as distributable reserves, which is a lovely fancy word uh, which just means it is money that I can distribute out to my members. So that's the first thing. Check that, um, check you even have profit. Because if you don't, then this whole procedure is regardless, right? It's not applicable to you. I'm sorry, maybe next time. The next thing you would do, which is something you do in every corporate transaction, uh, and that is to check the company's articles of association. As a reminder, if this is, particularly if this is your first uh, webinar with us, the Articles of Association are the principal governing document from which a company, uh, the company's rules uh, and methods of governance are dictated. And in any corporate transaction that you go through, number f you know, the first thing you'll do is check, right, are there any particular rules or procedures that are applicable to me in that particular case? And if you own a company, you need to know yours off by heart. They're not usually huge. Most run into about 20, 30 pages long. But I'm checking, make sure, is there anything that I need to take into account? If your company is like 90% of those companies out there using the model articles as prescribed uh, under the Companies Act, mm -hmm. or perhaps even um, if you formed your company through ourselves, uh, we use a slightly modified form of the model articles. I think the key provisions with regards to the dividends are basically identical. Once you're happy, that you've got profit. And once you're happy with the Articles of Association, we can get started with the actual procedure. And again, I know what I've just said seem is not earth shattering, but people get it wrong all the time, including the big ones. You know, there was a fairly famous case recently of Next, mm. uh, the fashion outlet, uh, fashion brand, uh, and even professionals in this area, Hargreaves Lans uh, Lansdowne, um, you know, they're commonly cited um, as even you know, the professionals, the big, the big guns, getting these procedures wrong. So the next thing we need to do is for the directors, or director of the company, your position as a director to recommend an amount. That recommendation usually comes out of a board meeting. Even if you're a sole director, you still should be recording these decisions. I know it's a bit weird having a meeting with yourself, but I would sit down one day and write, okay, I, as the director, in my position as the director, nothing else, even though I may be the only shareholder, it's my position, my authority, stems from the fact I'm a director here. I, as a director, recommend on this basis that we pay the shareholder, which is myself, or maybe me and one or two other people, we're gonna recommend this amount to be paid. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's how it always starts, and that resolution doesn't usually have to be long. It usually just says how much is going to be paid. It confirms, yeah, we've got the sufficient distributable reserves. It's going to talk about payment dates and so forth. It will vary from company to company, but that's the general basis. What then happens, it kind of splits into two. And I'm just talking about most companies here. It will then either go into being treated as an interim dividend or a final dividend. Um, what's the difference between those two? A final dividend very simply is a dividend that is issued or declared once the company has finalized its accounts. It's finalized its annual accounts for that period versus an interim dividend, which is of the opposite, where you know, it's a dividend based 
uh, in a position where the annual accounts have not been finalised. It's a small difference, but it is important. It's important for two reasons. Number one, it will determine if you have to go to the members, the shareholders, your position as a shareholder to then approve the dividend. If it is an interim dividend, good news, you don't need to go to the shareholders. Yourself as a shareholder, you don't need to go through that faff. If it is a final dividend, you will need to then pass a resolution to approve the dividend which you and your position as a director have recommended. In your position as a shareholder, you can't increase that amount. You can't say to the directors, hang on a minute, I think you're talking rubbish, you need to pay me 10% more. That's not permitted. Okay, so you pass an ordinary resolution, which means greater than 50% of all the eligible votes need to be cast in favour. That's if you do a final dividend. If you're doing an interim dividend, so the final, the final annual accounts have not been yet put together, then you don't need the shareholder approval. Doesn't necessarily mean that they should be declared any more or less. What I would say is, as a director, you're putting your neck on the line, particularly if you've got other shareholders to worry about, um, Liam, you've got, because you don't have that final set of accounts for that period to say, right, this is exactly the position, all right? So you're really putting your neck on the line, say, right, I think we're good. I would like to proceed with this interim dividend. Mm -hmm. So regardless, is it an interim dividend? You can just go straight ahead. You usually don't have to go to the shareholders. If it is a final dividend and you do need to go to the shareholders, well, then we, that we'll get them to pass an ordinary resolution. Remember, greater than 50% need to, uh, of the votes need to be cast in favour. can be done either at a general meeting or via written, board, uh, via written resolution. And once that has been completed, what normally then happens is a dividend voucher, very important, to pretty much a receipt to say this is, you know, this is what this money is about, it's pursuant to this dividend. If you don't get that, you know, you, you know, you, it might be treated as a salary, which will open its own can of worms. We'll come on to that in a minute. And finally, the bit that we all care about, which is the actual payment itself. You've gone through that process, we've done it to uh, across the every T, dotted every I, you can make the payment. Payments for dividends tends to take place either through cheque or more commonly now bank transfers. Actually the Companies Act is pretty relaxed in terms of how those payments can be made uh, from a cash perspective. Um, that's usually in a large company it's an agreement between the shareholder and director. The shareholder may say I'd like the money to be sent to me as uh, in this method. And that is how you declare a dividend, how you get the money from the limited company and make it your own. Okay, just a maybe one or two points here. How I want to dispel a few myths, I think, mm -hmm. um, and that is that in actuality, there's no there's no requirement, certainly under the Companies Act, as to the frequency. Um, the frequency or the timescales on which dividends need to be paid. Okay, I mean, of course, if you don't have any after-tax profit, it's, no, we're not, it's not even a conversation to be had. We can't do that. Uh, that it is something entirely down to the directors who have to be confident that there are sufficient distributable reserves, after-tax profits, that can be carried out uh, uh, to, to, to carry out this dividend. Now, as a final point, it is entirely, it is, you know, permissible that the company doesn't declare dividends. It might be the case that the directors decide not to do so. And that's absolutely fine. Profit, those after that, sorry, that after tax profit, which is not declared and give to the shareholders, that's called retained earnings. The, the entity, the company has retained the earnings, probably to reinvest back into the company for its future, future success. That is something, it's probably one of the big benefits of forming a limited company. You know, you've got this separate pot, separate away from you and you can shield that money. You know, you don't, it, it's not like with a sole trader where all the money earned is straight to your subject to tax and what have you. The money can, can be held in there, either to be reinvested or saved for a, late, for, for a rainy day. It's the, one of the very key benefits of running a business through a limited entity. Definitely, yeah. Um, and if, though, if you are wanting to explore, uh, so say you have maybe not have maybe haven't set up the company yet. Uh, if you are wanting to explore the options between a limited company or a sole trader, what might work best for yourself? We actually have a video on our YouTube channel. You can hear Nick speak more about this. Um, it's called Limited Company or Sole Trader. We help you decide. Uh, so look that one up and have a watch if you want to. 
Uh, now, people are probably, if you've seen a couple of our webinar episodes previous, you're probably starting to understand, you'll hear us say it a lot, check the articles, and it's, uh, another one is good record keeping. Um, you'll hear these a lot, so they will come up. When we're talking about dividends though, um, so there's always, um, I mean, there probably is going to be some tax implications with taking money out in this method. So just give us a quick rundown of what people can expect. Certainly, so, and you're right, I'm only gonna give the, the, the briefest of reviews mm. here. Um, if you receive dividends, uh, they will need to be declared on your self-assessment tax return. You'll need to file one of those. Okay, and if you receive dividends, then you will have to pay tax on those dividends. You're going to have to pay the mm -hmm. dividend tax. That payment, in term, from an administrative perspective, the rule is that you have to pay that tax um, on the in the January, following the end of the tax year in which you receive the dividends. Now, the end of the tax year is the sixth of April. So, just to take an example. It's currently at the time of recording, September 2023. So if I received a dividend now, maybe those £2,000 we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, September 2023, let's go to the end of the tax year, that's April 2024, which means I need to make sure HMRC gets my money, my tax, um, the dividend tax on the, that dividend by January 2025. Right. Not Sounds so far in the future, it's really not. Um, it's really not. So what are the tax rates? So dividend, uh, dividends are subject to uh, the dividend tax rate. Um, and the thing is, the taxation liability is not borne by the company. Okay? It's not borne by the company because as we talked about earlier, the, 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 the money that's available for dividends is from the after-tax profits. You know, corporation tax has already been taken out. So when we're talking about tax in relation to dividends, what we're really talking about is the individual liability that... Um, that has arisen. Now, before I go into that, firstly, there's a dividend, uh, a tax-free dividend allowance of now £1,000. It used to be higher. Uh, it wasn't long ago. It was about, about £5,000. I'm afraid that uh, has gone now down to £1,000. Let's just say, let's move that £1,000 out and let's talk about the rates. Now, the rates are labelled quite like the income tax rates, which we'll come on to in a short while. And the rates here in question um, are called the basic rate, the higher rate, and the additional rate, just like the income tax. Okay. The basic rate is 8.75%. The higher rate is 33.75, whilst the additional rate is 39.35%. You can probably already see those are some pretty favourable tax rates when we compare them with income tax. Now, what are they applicable to? Those dividend tax rates, let's take the basic rate, um, that is applicable to just short of 50,000, 50,270 pounds. It's applicable up to that amount on all taxable income. And I say divid, uh, ta all taxable income because the rate isn't applied just uh, on the basis of how much uh, you receive in dividends. It's an accumulation of all your other income salaries and so forth. So if you earn up to £50,270, if you earn that, then any dividends received will be applicable, subject of course to the, the personal allowance of £1,000 to a rate of 8.75% on the dividends received. Okay, it's not that you've got, an uh, you've got a stream of income which is going to be taxed on the income tax rates and a stream of dividends which is going to be uh, tax on that, that basis, you put them all together and that gives you your total taxable income and then that sets how much your dividends are going to be charged in terms of tax. So up to about £50,270, you are charged 8.75%. Now, greater than that, £50,270, so about £125,000, you are then subject uh, uh, to a, the higher rate. Uh, which is 33.75%. Okay, again, taxable, all taxable income, not just that, um, not just the, the money that you receive from the dividends. And then finally, the additional rate, everything greater than £125,000 odd, I can't remember the exact figure, uh, that would be 33, 39.35% uh, uh, as regards what you're going to get paid. So again, as I say, it 
the, 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 in the very first instance, it looks like these things, and I guess they do, compare quite favourably to the salary rates. There's more considerations than that that we need to take into account. You know, just if we just take that fifty thousand pound example, you know, under under the dividend tax rates I've just described, you're looking at uh, the basic rate of eight point seven five percent. Uh, versus if you're getting all of that through salary, you've got your income tax rate of 20%, national insurance contributions of 12%, which works out to basically a 32% uh, income uh, income tax rate there. Um, comes with a massive asterisk, Liam. Of course, yeah. Uh, so I guess that's, so we've looked then at dividends, and that's like we say, probably the one that everyone is going to be most familiar with. So let's turn our attention to then directors' salaries. How do we get started paying a salary? Okay, if you're paying a salary, so moving out of the dividend areas, hurtling straight forward to your standard salary. Mm -hmm. To pay a salary out of a limited company, you need to be the entity, the company needs to be registered for pay by e, pay as you earn. That registration needs to take place before the first payday is carried out, but it can't be any more than two months away. So you've got this little slither cannot be less uh, more than two months before your first payday, but whatever happens, it has to be before that first payday. So you'll register with HMRC for PayYE. Uh, the application is fairly standard. And you'll need to put, uh, give certain information, you know, company number, registration number. Um, you need to get your UTR, the Unique Taxpayer Reference Code, that will be sent to you by HMRC shortly after incorporation. That's an important one. You'll need that as part of your PayYE application. You'll need to declare you know, the nature of your business. You'll need to tell HMRC how many employees you have. The process, uh, what, you get all of that information, uh, you send it off to HMRC. Generally speaking, their turnaround time is about two weeks. And after the two weeks, you will get a PayYE reference number. And that's when you really can start your payroll, mm -hmm. right? So what then happens is then you, you take the, uh, the salary that you're going to be paying uh, to yourself. You'll have to work out what the income, um, the income tax charge and the national insurance contributions will be from there. You subtract them off. Um, if you have software, that's probably a good time to use that. We always encourage people to use payroll software. Otherwise, you're going to have to work it all out manually. So then you proceed with making the salary payment, and then you have 22 days, in most cases, 22 days after the payment of that salary to make sure that HMRC um, receives their national, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the amount that you've taken out, um, and you can pay that using the, on, the online uh, HMRC account for your company. Definitely. And if you are interested in registering your company for PayWay uh, registration, we actually offer a service that's $24.99 plus VAT, uh, and our team can help you submit that registration application to HMRC. So if you are interested in that, feel free to give our team a call. They're available on 0203 897 2233, or you can speak to our team on, uh, we've got a live chat function through our website or by email. They'll be more than happy to discuss this with you further, answer any questions you may have, and obviously help you get that registration in. So if we are, I mean, just to preempt the question that I know people are going to ask, but as a director, what should you be paying or what should they pay themselves? Um, <laughs> there's probably no right or <laughs> wrong answer. Sorry, there's no binary considerations uh, in, uh, in this world. Um, when you're answering that question, I think you've, you've got a few considerations to take into account. First and foremost is, of course, the income tax rates, which I sort of mm. loosely referred to earlier. Income tax rates follow the same sort of pattern uh, as dividend tax in terms of basic rate, higher rate, and additional rate. You, first, you get a tax-free personal allowance of 12, just north of £12,500. Um, then you have the basic rate, which is 20%, and that's everything up to 50,270. And then everything north of that, up to about 125,000. Um, I believe it's 40% now. And then everything north of 125,000 uh, odd is charged at 45%. So straight from the bat, you're thinking, okay, right, those rates uh, compare unfavorably to those of the dividend rates, which we were just talking about. But it's not the only consideration. Uh, the other consideration, because on top of those income tax, income tax rates, we have to consider national insurance uh, contributions. 
you know, what, are, what is national insurance? This refers to things like the state pension and any other benefits that, uh, that, that or certain other types of benefits. And the thing is to be able to access them, you need to pay, you need to make certain contributions in most cases. Um, and that's, but that's actually, all right, let me kind of asterisk that, lots of asterisks today. So what I've just said is unless you pay international, uh, uh, your paying or national insurance means you may not necessarily, um, you, you need to do that to be able to access the state uh, pension and so forth. Not entirely true. Your eligibility to, you know, uh, build up credit in, um, with the, your national insurance actually starts at what's called the lower earnings threshold. It's about 8,000. I can't remember the specifics, but you need to receive over £8,000-odd. As soon as you start receiving greater than £8,000 through salary, you become eligible. Okay, But you can still earn a little bit more than that and still not, as an employee, make any contributions um, in terms of national insurance. So you can do that all the way up to about £12,500. Okay? So what you find, Liam, is that Directors may often use that twelve and a half thousand pounds as a sort of a practical threshold. We say, right, you know, I want need to be able to make use of the national insurance in due course, whether it be the state pension or other or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I don't want, I, you know, I want to make sure I keep a lid on on you know uh, on tax liabilities. So what happens is they may determine or may decide that twelve and a half thousand pounds is the limit of what I want to pay myself through salary. Okay, because as an employee, I don't pay any income tax. I'm above the lower earnings limit, LEL, um, which means you know, I build up credit as regards national insurance, but I don't need to make any further uh, national insurance contributions, which kick in once you breach that twelve and a half thousand pound mm -hmm. threshold. Okay, definitely. So you can see where that combination of methods that you were talking about comes in. Um, so then if we move away from salaries, now we get on to director's loans. Now this one can seem a little bit intimidating because of that word loan. Um, so I guess give us a bit of a rundown on what we can expect. Yeah, uh, completely fair. It's an area which is not particularly well known, um, but not necessarily, not necessarily something that needs to be feared. Let's just clarify right from the off. When we're talking about director's loan, we are not talking about going up to a bank asking for some money, agreeing to their terms, their stringent terms and payment, repa uh, payment re period, repayment periods, um, and then constantly hounding your company for financial information, wondering when they're going to get their money back. That's not what a director's loan is. There's actually two types of director's loans. Uh, the first of which is that a company can borrow money from its director, which it might do to help fund certain activities for a certain period or what have you. The other type of director loan is in the other direction, where the director takes money out, borrows money from the company um, uh, for a certain period. And it's that latter one that we're talking about, because we're talking about taking money out. And yes, we've got to repay it. I know it's a bit of an outlier, but uh, I still think it's, uh, very, you know, it's important, particularly for people at the start um, who are just starting out in their company, oftentimes making use of the director's loan uh, is something that, that that they would carry out, and you mentioned earlier how you know how taking money you know taking money out of a company is in the case of putting the company card into the the ATM and then withdrawing money, and there you are, you got your money out. Well done. We don't need a webinar about it. Um, this is probably as close as you'll get to that scenario. Although it's again not exactly just like <laughs> that. So what's the process for a director's loan? Well, very. Sorry, I, I have to. I have to say, it. first and foremost, check your articles of association. What are the rules that that, that surround this? Mm -hmm. The next uh, the next thing you need to do is, as a board, even if it's just yourself, you're probably going to want to have a meeting, or to pass a director resolution. And what this meeting or resolution will do is essentially, to some extent, authorize the loan to be taken out. It's not a particularly long resolution, you know, the ones I put together are usually no more than a page, mm. and it really just confirms some of the basic information about the loan. What is the, how much, how much money is being taken out? 
um, by who? If there's multiple directors, have uh, you know has that director declared the interest in line with their director duties to say, look, all right, the business we're transacting, I benefit from this. Mm -hmm. So we talked about repayment period, the amount taken out, what's the interest going to be? This all gets stuck on. As I say, it's not a huge uh, um, uh, resolution to go through. And even if you're a sole director, I mean, you really, I mean, this is one of those areas where administration is even more important than, mm. um, than, else, uh, than, than the usual importance that we place upon it. Now, where it then diverges is the, is the dividend amount. Anything, in general terms, anything, any direct loan up to £10,000 needs no f further authorization. Well, certainly for companies using the model articles or indeed our own our articles of association. Having said that, if the loan is greater than £10,000, normally what, what's needed then is for the shareholders to approve. And even if it's just your company, once again, you alone, your, you know, your approval therefore now comes in your position as a shareholder, not that director. So you now you need further records to put together to say, right, I as a shareholder would like to approve this director's loan. And again, that resolution will usually state how much it's for, who it's going to, interest rates and some repayment dates, what have you. And that needs to be approved by the shareholder or shareholders by passing an ordinary resolution. The ordinary resolution, um, as we just like what we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. the ordinary resolution requires greater than 50% of the votes to be cast in favour. Oftentimes, uh, just as, uh, as, a, as an addendum to that, sometimes the loans are then detailed in a memorandum. Uh, I don't think it is compulsory. Uh, some people just elect to base it entirely on, on the board resolution. It's probably good to you know, get, get everything down on the memorandum. Mm. Um, and that's the money taken out. Okay, the money is yours. Why do people do that? Um, well, it's a good way of covering short-term costs that you may have incurred. The company may not be profit-making, maybe dividends aren't uh, applicable, maybe f tax purposes, maybe uh, the paying it through a salary may not be the best idea at the moment. So I've got a few bills I've got to pay. I've got rent, I need to live somewhere, so I could take some money out of my company um, just to cover that period. Mm -hmm. And usually what you would then do is pay that back within nine months and a day uh, from the end of that period. And if you do that, if you do repay it uh, within nine months and a day of the accounting period, then there's no income, uh, there's no tax charge. Um, there is if you don't pay it back in that period. It's a pretty hefty charge, 33.75%. 33.75% if you fail to uh, pay it back in the prescribed time. So, you know, the director's loan, the general recommendation is not to use it as the first order of business. It's great for sort of maybe emergency situations or if you've got no other option, mm -hmm. but it is fairly, administ fairly administratively burdensome and the consequences of getting it wrong can be pretty uh, expensive. So you really need to keep your eye out on that one, okay? You really need to keep your eye out on that one. Um, otherwise, all those benefits that we had start disappearing very quickly. Definitely, yeah. Um, and so finally, let's come on to our fourth method, which is going to be expenses, which I know isn't taking money out in the stricter sense, um, but obviously quite handy for business owners to know about. Uh, so can you give us a rundown of how expenses work? Yeah, so expenses is essentially a case of being able to reclaim the money paid for certain expenses from the company. And the company then can apply for tax relief on, on, on that amount. Mm -hmm. And it's quite good from a, from a tax efficiency perspective um, because you know, it reduces the profit that, that, that the company has. Uh, and therefore, if you have a reduced profit, your corporation tax liability therefore decreases. So it's mm -hmm. quite a handy tool. And it's a handy tool for the recipients, certainly. I mean, they're the, pr the principal beneficiaries here because they're able to pay for certain things and expense it to the company. It's a wide range of things that they can expense, computing and office equipment, um, you know, certain travel expenses, training costs, uh, at even company cars. Uh, that is also included on it. And the, the, the thing about it as well, um, I mean, if you work from home, you can also expense certain things like heating, 
uh, like utilities and so forth, you're, using, you're in your house, you're using electricity, maybe not for your personal reasons, that's also something that can be done. And, um, and the, the other good thing is that you, you may be, you can certainly claim certain uh, expenses or, or um, for things that maybe isn't used entirely for work. Okay, and just before we go into questions or anything, like we said at the start, we'll have some time to run through some vital information for our customers outside the UK. So maybe just give us uh, an idea of things to consider for our non-UK customers. Yeah, sure. Um, and I said we're going to we'll talk about this. Yeah. Um, so there's a few you know, things I'd want to discuss here. Um, I've got to say from the off that, you know, as we know, as a, as a non-resident, you are able to set up a company pretty easily in the UK. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have lived here. You don't need to be living here. You don't even need to be having um, ever visited the UK. There's no requirement that someone has to be associated with um, the UK in order to set up a company. I'm afraid when it comes to, you know, when it comes to tax and, and financial matters, things get a lot more complicated straight off the bat, mm -hmm. uh, and which is why, uh, you know, why we can't talk. There's, there's only so many things we can talk about. Yeah. Um, why is it so complicated? Well, it, 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 there's so many different factors that come into play. It's individual. It's an individual case. Things like, you know exactly what work are you carrying out for your limited company here in the UK? What's the status of double tax treaties that might be in existence? Okay. Um, all these sorts of factors which can only be taken into account on an individual basis, uh, they will pile in uh, and determine your liabilities and therefore what the most efficient way may be if we're talking purely on an efficiency basis, you know, all the practical mm -hmm. things we talked about are the same, whether you're resident or otherwise, um, that will determine what the best way is to take it out. So the headline here, Liam, mm -hmm. is that if uh, you are non-resident, you need tax, uh, you need to get yourself some tax advice. Okay. Yep. And the other thing to say here is that HMRC know this is an area which people struggle on. Again, it's complicated. Yeah. Anyone who's ever researched this sort of thing will know that. They know that it is difficult. So compliance or you know, your compliance checks are frequent. Um, and if you get it wrong, you could be in a lot of hot water, find yourself with a hefty bill. So keep yourself safe, make sure you, you, know, you get that sort of advice. So, Next thing I want to dispel is that just because you're non-resident means you don't have to pay, uh, don't have to file a tax return. Mm -hmm. That is not the case, okay? Or at least it's not the case in most instances. Yeah. Um, even if you earn a tax-free amount, all the things that we talked about earlier, you may it, you may still have to file a tax return. It's based on certain things like you know, have you worked even just one day in the UK? You may have come to the UK just to uh, hold a board meeting doesn't matter if it's just for one day, that usually triggers the requirement to mm -hmm. submit a, a self-assessment tax return. It may be because you've taken a UK salary or taken a director's fees or even uh, received an expense. If you meet those criteria, and they're pretty broad criteria, they capture most people, if you receive them, then that being the case, you are likely to have to file a self-assessment tax return. Now, just before, I'm going to try going through just a few of the points very briefly. Again, there's only so many things I can say, but usually with, with non-residents, the totality of their income is factored in. Okay, you take everything into account, um, subject to the various rules uh, that are in place, um, and that leads to your total okay. uh, the, the amount taken, uh, the, the, you know, your tax charge. I'm afraid that's um, you know that that's just a given on here. So, <coughs> as regards dividends, uh, these you know if you're a non-resident, dividends tend to be classed uh, as what uh, in, in what's called investment income, which can be free from UK income tax. Um, it's called disregarded income. That's a very simplistic look look at it, um, and it is complicated in how you get to it. But the end result may be that you can get 
those funds uh, you know, in sort of a tax-free style. Mm. Second thing to say is from a salary perspective. So salary is treated, you know, if, you, if, if you're a director, even though you're not technically employees, it's treated the same as if you were an employee. And if you carry out work in the UK, uh, then you are likely to trigger mm. the, um, you know, those sorts of pay-y obligations. If you're non-resident, then usually you only, you only pay sort of income tax on the, the UK work that you do. It's very difficult, I think, to justify that if you are a director of a limited company that you do absolutely nothing right, for the UK company. You don't do anything to dispense your duties, which probably opens its own can of worms, you know, it's the director carrying out the work that they need to. Um, so, that, you know, it's very, it, it's very difficult to tell. Um, and so even if you're outside of the UK, for, m for the most part, you may still have that liability that comes in. You've also got to take into account things like what happens if your situation changes. You know, maybe you move to the UK throughout the tax year or maybe you move out of the UK, in, in which case you, you, you have things like split, uh, split year treatment, uh, which factors in, completely, I'm, I'm afraid, completely outside, the, um, completely outside the, the, the remit of this webinar, but that's just another consideration that's got to be taken into account because oftentimes people's you know, status mm -hmm. is not consistent. Things change, life changes. Mm -hmm. The final thing uh, to say, Liam, is on expenses. Um, non uh, sorry, non-resident directors do, generally speaking, still need to pay income tax, you know, national insurance contributions where applicable on expenses that they've received. I think the big one for probably non-residents is travel, particularly if you know travel to and from the UK, uh, accommodations and subsistence during their time here. Mm -hmm. uh, the exact position um, as to whether you know you can gain tax relief. It's based on whether you know, the UK is sort of that the permanent or temporary uh, place of work. I think to be counted as permanent, I think you usually have to spend, HMRC's views, you have to spend about 40% of your time. So I know there's, a, there's, a, there's a, only a few thoughts here, uh, and I really have to belabor the point that um, it's in, you know, it, it is dependent on your situation. You take into account everything. And that then leads to your, in, your, your, your tax liability. So it depends on your particular circumstances and yeah. things like director's loans. I, you know, I think that's the, by and large, the tax, the tax liabilities there are on the company side. So just, just to let you know that, that, that the, the rules are generally speaking the same there as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that key point that you made there was, you know, we know this is a focus area for HMRC. Um, so get yourself some advice and don't get caught out. Um, so just to give a bit of life to what we've been talking about today, let's just quickly run through a couple examples to see how people can use the combination of the things we've talked about today. Okay, so let's just say that you want to, you're seeking to take money out to the tune of about 50, uh, uh, 50 or 50,270. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you took that out all as a salary, then your take home payment would be about 38,000 pounds. Still a respectable amount. But using a combination, I just want to go back to what we were talking earlier that most persons, most you know, companies don't just use a single way of extracting money. Um, let's discuss how we can use a combination. So let's start with the salary because we're not going to pay that entire amount for you know, a salary. Mm -hmm. Let's ref, uh, remind ourselves about the national insurance contributions. Um, we have a personal um, allowance of 12,500 odd. So maybe, maybe that first 12,500 is, is uh, paid by a salary. We're above the lower earnings threshold, so you, um, you're able to build those credits for national insurance, but because you don't breach that amount, income tax and uh, national insurance contributions don't kick in. And what you do then is then you declare the remaining 38, almost 38,000 pounds in shareholder dividends. Okay, again, I'm presuming that you're the sole shareholder here. You got the tax-free allowance of 1,000 mm -hmm. pounds uh, from dividends and cumulati cumulatively altogether, um, the amount of taxable income you have is about 52,000 pounds. The appropriate tax rate here uh, for the dividends is 8.75%. Uh, so the 8.75% uh, 8 um, would mean a total tax liability of just short of £4,000, and that means your take-home pay suddenly has gone up from about £38,000 up to um, 
up to uh, up to about 47 going 48,000 pounds that's you know so immediately you can see that using that combination has really put yourself into a better position there definitely but the second um, second scenario might be well let's just say you've recently started your company uh, it hasn't made any profit yet and that's a big problem because as we know dividends can't be paid unless the company has made um, or you know achieved a certain level of profit no, not a certain level of profit, it has um, received or achieved post-tax profit. So that's dividends out of the way, but you know, you've got to live. You need to pay bills, your mortgage or what have you. So let's take the salary and let's just say for this particular example, we're going to take it up to 12,500. Mm -hmm. um, you take it up to 12,500, above that lower earnings limit, not high enough that you start with the income tax charge, um, or national insurance contributions, mm -hmm. but 12,500 probably isn't nearly enough for you. So that's when you might start taking those short-term director loans out. Okay, you take the director's loans account, uh, out of about 10,000 pounds, being sure to pay back nine months and a day after the end of that period. Mm -hmm. And that can help you cover. I mean, obviously maybe that isn't a, um, where, where you live, that may not be enough to subsist, but so you might uh, increase the salary a little bit more to achieve that. But you know, using that dividend tax, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the director's loan just helps you keep going until such time that you do maybe have profit. Maybe your company will be able to turn a profit mm -hmm. soon, which is great because you don't have to go through certain timescales to pay dividends. You don't have to wait a year to do so. Um, you, can, you, know, you can start bringing them in a lot quicker. But that just helps you get to that point a lot sooner. So uh, use of the salary and maybe the director's loans maybe temporary, keep an eye out because otherwise if you, if, you, if you hold on to that loan amount for too long and you don't repay it, you could end up with quite a sizable mm -hmm. tax uh, charge. It's under section 455, uh, section 455 tax charge, I think it is, you know, 33 odd 0.75% can become quite expensive very soon. Mm -hmm. But in that second example, Liam, you know, we're not making profit. That one's out of the, um, uh, out of the question, therefore, so maybe I'm going to use a combination this time instead of dividends and salary. Remember, I'm going to use salary and director's loans just to cover until I can get myself into a better position. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we knew that this was going to be a popular topic and we've had uh, a lot of questions come through. So let's try and get through a couple. We do have time for uh, a few. As I said at the beginning, uh, any questions that we don't get to, don't worry, our team will reach out to you by email to get answers across to you. Um, so if you don't hear your question, uh, don't worry, we will get an answer out to you. Um, but we've got one here from Adam. So is a director's salary compulsory for all directors? It's not in the general sense. There's nothing under the Companies Act or similar that says you have to pay uh, directors a salary. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what you agree with the director, be it in their service agreement, uh, yeah, their service contract, or, or if for whatever reason, I don't think I've ever seen it, but if there was something in your articles to say you have to pay the directors this amount. Um, and the reason you can do that, ev even, if your even if your director's there working for you, is that the office of director is not uh, is not subject to the national minimum wage. I think that's I think that's right. the thing that a lot of people get worried about. Um, so without that, you know, that's why they're able to be paid far less or maybe nothing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just, I've got another one, which is actually a really good follow-up question on that one there. Um, but is there such a thing as paying yourself too much? No, I don't. Okay, the, the, the sort of the hard, the, 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 the yes or no answer, mm. and then there's the sort of the consequential answer. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, again, just going to the act, there's nothing to say you can only pay a certain amount to a director. You know, we, we see a lot in the, in the media about how people at the very top of companies, are, you know, their pay may be uh, becoming excessive. You know, I think uh, I remember reading not long ago, you know, the chief executive is paid about 40 times uh, what maybe the lowest pay, uh, paid person in the company uh, is, is being paid. Um, so there's no hard limit saying you can only pay X amount. Yeah. The, where it becomes grey, I mean, there's, I guess the big consideration is probably your director's duties, particularly the duty to promote the success of the company, mm. um, you know, for the benefit of the members and other stakeholders. This is section 172. We actually did a uh, webinar, mm -hmm. uh, we actually did a webinar um, 
a couple of months ago now, I think it was, specifically on the director duties. So if you haven't seen that, uh, I encourage you to, to, to take a look there. Um, now, as a director, you have a duty to the company. Again, as I say, to promote the success of it. If you take an exorbitant salary out of the business, when maybe it can't really afford it, even if you have the money now, but what about in the future? What about a rainy day fund or something like that? If the company then goes kaput, you know, it, it goes under or what have you, then the attention will then perhaps turn to your conduct as a director. Should you have been taking all of that money out? Because now uh, the company no longer exists. So the members, mm -hmm. even if it's you, uh, have, have lost out. But maybe you had employees. Maybe all these people are out of a job now because you took so much money out and you lost out. There's no mm. company to pay. In which case, yeah, maybe it's arguable that, that, that um, you, you breach your duty. So the hard and fast rule is, no, there's nothing, certainly within the Companies Act, that says, this is your top amount. You're not allowed to pay anymore. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. You've got to yeah. take, factor in other things, in particular, I think, the director response, but uh, duties. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and we've got... Ooh. So we've got an interesting one here. So today we've focused main, mainly on companies limited by shares. Um, but can I get a salary as a director of a limited company by guarantee? Yes, you can. I think um, where this question comes from is a, is a misunderstanding um, about what limited by guarantee companies are. So limited by guarantees, you know, today we were talking about, okay, yeah. Today we've been talking a lot about limited by shares mm. because it's the most common type of company. I think it's like 95% of all registered companies are limited by shares. Limited, limited by guarantees are very similar to share, uh, limited by shares and really only differ in one key aspect and that's the membership of the company. Whereas a limited by shares is owned by the shareholders, a limited by guarantee company does not have any shareholders. It has guarantors instead who own the business and simply guarantee a certain amount if the company was ever to enter into financial difficulty, hence the name. Now, where I think the confusion has come from, or, 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 or where it frequently comes from when I speak to uh, people who ask me the same question, um, limited by guarantee companies are the favoured vehicle for, hap, uh, for perhaps if you're seeking to operate in a more charitable sense. Mm -hmm. So you might be registering with a charities commission, you're, you're, you're forming what's called a uh, a charitable company, it's an entity registered at the company's house, usually via uh, a limited by guarantee, which is then registered at the Charities Commission for mm -hmm. and acting as the vehicle for your charitable operations. Now, where the confusion may arise is normally those sorts of limited by guarantee companies have specific uh, rules in, in the Articles of Association which restrict um, payments of salaries to directors, even, even restricting director expenses. I think the model charity articles specifically also do not allow for directors to be paid a salary. Mm -hmm. Okay, But that is entirely based on what's in, 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 in the Articles of Association, which may be based upon um, um, you know, your, the reason that you're forming it. Okay, As I say, limited by guarantees, favoured method if you're going to form a company for your charity, mm -hmm. um, which usually includes sections say not only can you not pay the directors but you also can't pay any profits to the members they're just there to guarantee and vote on certain things that's not a given a limited by guarantee company absolutely can be paying a director a salary and indeed <laughs> there's another myth you can actually give your uh, pay your members a profit uh, or from profit uh, in a limited by guarantee if your if your articles of association permitted that um, so that's probably where some of that confusion comes from. If you are limited by guarantee, and so long as there are provisions within the articles to allow it, I think even the model guarantee articles do it, um, then you should have no problem paying a director's salary. Lovely. Now, we have actually run out of time, but I do just want to get one more question in here. I'll be a little cheeky. Um, just because someone would like some clarification So on a, on a point that we raised earlier. So we said that there are no national insurance contributions at £12,570, but don't employers do so over the secondary threshold, which is lower than the primary th threshold? Yes. Okay, so again, just to clarify, what I say is that employee, uh, the employees don't pay any national insurance contributions um, when you earn above the lower earnings limit, but before that threshold of £12,500. There's something called the secondary threshold, 
uh, which is when employers start paying national insurance contributions. Um, and I think it falls somewhere in between that lower earnings limit of about £8,000 and £12,500. Uh, the reason I d haven't really gone into that is because, well, um, salaries that you pay are an allowable expense, uh, which means that you sort of can claim tax relief on those. Mm -hmm. uh, and in doing so, reduce your profit, uh, reducing the, um, the, the corporation tax of the company, which I think sort of pretty much cancels that out. Okay. I don't think it does it entirely. Um, it's sort of an, it, it's sort of this addendum um, to that, um, whereupon maybe m maybe you know there is the employer's contributions, but there is um, in practical terms maybe because it's cancelled out, it sort of doesn't mean all too much. But certainly at that twelve thousand five hundred amount, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's employees don't pay anything, but the employers do. But there's other considerations, in, in particular with corporation tax, which uh, gets factored in. That, that's I, I think probably what I'd say to that. Fantastic. Now, I do apologize that we have actually run out of time. Um, as, a, as always, we had a, a lot of questions come through. Don't worry if you haven't ha heard yours uh, be answered today. We will get answers out to you by email. Um, and if you do have any other further questions or you'd like to speak to us or provide any feedback or suggestions, anything like that, we love hearing from you. So please do send uh, any communications across to us. You can get us on talks at firstformations.co.uk. And just a reminder that with this session was recorded. Give us 24 to 48 hours and we'll get this one up on YouTube if you do want to have a rewatch or revisit any of the topics we've t covered today. Um, or while you're there, check out any of the other videos that we have up. Like I say, we've got heaps of videos on a whole range of topics, our previous webinars, as well as others. And we also have our blogs through the website and our support team are available on live chat, email, or over the phone. Um, but otherwise, if we don't speak to you before then, thank you for joining us today. It's been fantastic having you um, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers.